like to see uh, a few of you stuck around. I'm like, Megan, there's going to be a little bit of overlap, but I figure I went so fast you missed a bunch of it anyway, so I'll just have to duplicate some. I always tell people in this whole thing, I've been at it a long time, that confusion is the first step in learning, so how you do it? <laughs> you got it, you got it. So confusion in the fact that, you know, looking at, at Sandy Sol in central Wisconsin, you know, uh, what she does that gets away with you might not, and that's good because then you don't have to copy her, but the principles and the ideas might be quite you know, fit many people. And I hear people down here, someone from way up northern Wisconsin, from way down in southern Illinois. I'm sorry, we got different opportunities and different kind of disasters. One place or the other, up north, the winter takes care of a lot of things. We can graze our cover crops because the ground is all frozen. So we got all our different kind of things out here. Uh, so you're going to see that uh, also what happens to farmers, you got to be really careful. And she brought it up quite a bit. We've been at this so long that once we have a failure, it might have been our own fault, but we're not willing to do it again. And so, you know, so we come to conclusions about things. What's the simplest, easy, what's the one cover crop that you can't hardly get rid of and it really works and it's fairly inexpensive? What works up here? Rye. You can't hardly, if you're going to do one thing, you bloody well better do rye. Now, that means for, you notice we do it in front of corn and soybeans. We do rye everywhere. And the other thing that I take out here, and you've got to recognize that we're tight old Germans. The other thing we do out here, what's our cheapest seeds we can get? Well, rye's not too bad. We grow our own seed. Oats. A little red clover. Now, our cocktail mixes? Come on, we're organic. We got weeds. We got a multi-diversity species going on all the time. So, so anyway, this is a, actually it's an interesting picture, and I told several people about this. This is from Colorado. And this guy spoke at the Acres Conference, Brendan Rocky, and I got him to speak there because it's really, really interesting. Is he used to, he's a potato farmer. And he's the highest altitude farming in North America, so it freezes about every month of the year. And it used to be every four years potatoes, and now it's every other year. Anywhere you go, and in the central sands is a good example, anywhere there's potato growing, all the vegetable companies, everybody else moves in because they know they need a rotation. They don't have to pay them much for their rotation crop. So they can get them to grow peas and beans and all stuff almost for nothing. So Brendan said, I got tired of doing alfalfa and selling hay. I got tired of canola. I got tired of all the things that didn't make money. Instead of four-year potatoes, it's every other year. In a speech at Acres, which so I'll go, i got to go back out there again next summer. I haven't been there for a while. He talked about a wind erosion because, see, this is probably five, six years ago. This is a sandy soils out there. they got sand dunes along the mountains, the Rocky Mountains, and the windstorms are terrible. And so they keep forcing no-till, no-till, no-till. And so he said, I'm driving home one day, and I pulled up my road. And he said, there's so much sand in here, you couldn't see where to go. And our road is crystal clear. He said, I stopped my car. Every the University of Colorado's got an experiment station three miles away. And he said, the county extension service, they all showed up and standing on my road. And he said, please, do not tell my after no till. Mine got the only soil not blowing. So the other part of the story is, see that crop right there? They mowed it. He's going to grow potatoes next year. Do you think he's going to leave that? Oh, no. A big old Miller disc comes, no, no, it's a sunflower, a sapphire disc or something, pulls in here. Summer's disc, I guess. Disc it down. Waits two weeks, puts a ton of compost on, disc it down again. Now, the growing season is really short. We're in the North Carolina. Then the next spring, he starts out, potatoes, we're going to till it again. We're going to plant potatoes. We're going to hill them, and we're going to dig them. And what were his pictures at the Acres Conference? In that country, you only get five inches of rain, and it's all irrigated. And what the irrigation rigs do is the guys that do irrigation have straw bales on the end of the field to fill in the wheel tracks because they sink in because of this light soils and all this rain. And now that he's been doing this system, there's no more straw bales, and his irrigation rigs are running on top. The soil structure has completely changed with aggressive tillage. Now, he says, I think it was my herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides, and pesticides, and nitrogen that was destroying my soil before, because he said it certainly changed, and it certainly has nothing to do with tillage. So I think we've got to look deeper at some of these things, and that gets his situation. Now, uh, I'll show you some things about this here, but I just want to go through, because a, a friend of mine in Iowa went to a cover crop meeting. And uh, he had a nine-way or seven-way cocktail mix, and it was $40 an acre. And the guy said, oh, my gosh, how can you afford that? And Bob said, oh, by the way, I doubled the application rate. It was on $80 an acre. And he said, I want to know how not. He said, it's my nitrogen. It's my nutrient storage. It's my time-release fertilizer. It's my erosion protection in building my soils. It's my carbon sequestering, getting more organic matter in my soils. It's my insect control. It's my disease prevention, and he says, I'm building my resilience in my soil, and I'm increasing water holding capacity, and I'm at my weed control better. I did that all for $80 an acre. <laughs> See, so I guess everybody doesn't quite look at it the same way, do they? 
So anyway, we'll see. This series got some interesting things going on. So then I showed this one here this morning, and that's where I think we got to talk about this cover crops and interseeding. And just wanted to review again is that this the date of putting that crop back into the ground is extremely critical. That one on the mature crop was a full vetch, grown fully mature with a high nitrogen credits, and the one on the right was a young succulent clover crop, and it was all about that digestibility. And it was all about, I showed those, the brown carbon, green carbon, and why we have to know when we're going to terminate those cover crops. Uh, see, this one here is that digestibility, that big tall rye in there. Someone was asking about that. See, we were going to plant soybeans in, and the reason we're mowing it because we couldn't get through with the tillage tool we had. It wasn't big enough to get through it. Now, we've since changed that, and we changed ourselves to went, we had a, a, a lemkin, and we went to a bigger lemkin. Because, see, I, not, I don't want to till. You've got to recognize what we are doing on our farm. It's very, we are not interested in doing any more tillage than absolutely necessary. We are also interested in only tilling the top few inches and running deep rippers. I was on a, a, a guy, uh, it's actually a, a really true story, in Minnesota we hired a new plant manager, and he said, I'm 100% no-till on my farm, and he also works in the fertilizer company business. And I said, oh, really? I said, what did you do last fall? It was raining every day. We were combining beans, and we're sinking in four to six inches. What, oh, he said, yeah. I said, I run a ripper after I get my beans harvested. He said, I was doing the same thing. And I said, you said you had 240 bushel corn. How do you farm the next year with all those rest? Oh, he said, I run a vertical tillage machine after I get my corn harvested. I said, I thought you were no-till. He said, well, I do. I no-till plant the beans, and I no-till plant the corn. <laughs> but ripping and vertical tillage and shallow incorporating are not bad practice for anybody, anywhere, anytime. So anyway, that we had to mow that, but we're trying to suck up all the nutrients, and that's rye. See, and then we'll put that in. We want that to starve all the minerals, and we want it to be slow in digestibility. Because it's going to be soybeans, we'll get more nodules, and we aren't going to feed the weeds. And so you've got to get those ideas into your head, I think. And then just like compost, why do you do compost? What's the difference between putting down, you know, what, what's the advantage just taking manure, a bedding pack manure and spread it on the ground? Because it has to digest down and it's putting a drag on your soil. When you put compost on it, now some people talk about humified compost and mature compost, all that means is it's digested for, far enough along so it now becomes a sponge to hold your minerals and it's not going to put a drag on your system because the bugs aren't still working away. The soil biology eats first and then they give up the nutrients, but it's already digested. So if we are going to do this compost, notice the white stuff up front, that's what we put rock phosphate and gypsum in these piles. See, it's a nice place to, we're trying to minimize our spreading trips, and you can't, you wouldn't put lime in a compost pile, but you sure can put rock phosphate. If you want to make rock phosphate into fertilizer, put it in a compost pile, and you, as it digests, it becomes part of the carbon biological cycle. Minerals, plants need all a range of minerals, but the struggle is organically, we got to use minerals that are really slow release that need a biological or an acidic breakdown. You're just speeding up the biology right here. Otherwise, you could put acidity with them to get those nutrients in exchange. And so now those are pretty well. I, you can see I had my tarp and we covered them and we used to have a compost turner, but ah, I can't get all the work done anymore. And so, you know, after a while pulling that tarp and doing this, you know, we kind of go through things and we got beyond it. Uh, so this one here, I think, was brought up by somebody yesterday, just a little bit of review out here. You see, I think these are some of the rules of soil health. It doesn't say no-till, it says minimum disturbance. And I think we've got to look at I don't find research very successful to me, and I don't want to pick on your research people. If you're talking about major tillage against no-till, that's not fair. There's another system, shallow incorporating and deep ripping. Let's compare that system to no-till. That's another whole system of farming. Leave middle zone alone. Like I said, the no-till guys taught us we can't plow, dig, and disc every day. The strip-till guys taught us you got to get these deep roots. You place your net in deep, and you get your earthworm channels and your roots. The highest fertile ground on your farm is a half-inch circle around every root because the plant gives out exudates to feed the biology. And that's where all the minerals and the biology are. So if that little decaying root or an earthworm channel, if the next root can follow that same channel, we don't have growing, roots growing sideways, and we got it in the most fertile spot on your farm, no matter what your soil test says. Whoops. What did I do there? Come on. There we go. Uh, I got to have my soil covered. We try to have as much covered as possible. If you drive by our farm today, you'd say, wow, there's a lot of open land. The only land that does not have something growing on it is where we're going to seed down to forages in the spring, like alfalfa and using winter wheat as a nurse crop or triticale peas and alfalfa. Everything else got something growing on it. It looks like we got a lot of open crops. We planted rye in September, and it's no taller than an inch. Ah, cold and wet. I have planted rye. 
I, three years ago, I was having fun because I was the first. I want, I'm tired of being the last guy to plant, so I wanted to be the first guy to plant. So on January 3rd, we planted our rye. And guess what? It grew. Now, we didn't drill it in. We bulk spread it with a fertilizer buggy right on top of frozen ground. And lo and behold, the freezing and thawing by spring, we had a rye crop. A couple of years ago, a long time ago, I was out one day. I called a friend of mine in Michigan, and he said he was out planting rye. I said, I was told I had to quit by the 10th of November. He said, oh, just plant it. So now we don't have an ending date. I suppose March could be the ending date. So maximum biodiversity, like I said, our weeds help that situation, and then we got to have this presence of living roots, and even though they might not look like much, and you dug under that snow in the wintertime, it's always kind of fun to see what that is. This is another system. I, can't, I talked about Brendan Rocky with his rotation, and I'll show you some more pictures. But this here is out in, in Virginia, and this is a vegetable farm, and I know you guys aren't all into vegetables, but one year soil building, one year farming, this is a, not a soil building year. If you're going to grow vegetables, that's a million-dollar CSA on 50 acres and they want 100 acres of land. So half of the farm is in soil building, every, and that's not it. That's got Swiss chard in it, under plastic, plus the cover crop. So next year that gets to have a soil building here, and then it goes into vegetable production. You realize how much easier that gets to be for weed control, health of the plant, growth of the plant? So I think we can take some of those principles even on our corn crop. We certainly can on our seed corn, corn crops. And I showed you this about our tillage and taking things down. The other comment I want to make about this one is that I'm pretty convinced that disc and rotavators, somebody says, oh, that rotavator is a soil-destroying tool, only on bare ground. You wouldn't take a disc on bare ground, would you? They're cutting and smearing and they're running through the mud. You think you can destroy that soil? I was telling people years ago, I went into a tall sorghum sedan with my rotavator, and I was rotivating through the field. It was just taller than that. And I, and I saw the grass move in front of me, the sorghum sedan grass. And I saw that move, and I thought, oh, that must be a rabbit in here. No, well, I got to the end, and it was a raccoon. And it ran away, and it went right through the rotavator. If it had been bare ground, it would have been meat and bone and blood meal. Because of all those residues, I didn't say it didn't get beat up. I said it, got, it went through the rotavator. You see, all that, the soil is the same way. That blade is not cutting and smearing on bare ground. It's not doing the soil damage. So we're really more uncomfortable with the Second pass tillage, we're getting ready to plant. We had to till that again, but we had to wait a while because we didn't take it down. And we're, I mean, it's the middle of the summer. We're trying to grow a cover crop. We're not going to plant it in July. We're going to wait to the first week in August and plant that cover crop. So see now, we got that work down, but there's no way we did soil damage with all that root mass. And I tell everybody, got to shallow incorporate. The taller it is, the deeper you go. The secret, and I stood on a farm in 1976 with 375 bushel corn in Illinois, public variety on 40-inch rows. And you could stick your hand in the ground clear to your elbow. And it was in the paper that he put on 400 units and that in 400 phosphorus. That was all my manure. And this guy was a fanatic with his Graham chisel plow. He kept deepening his aerobic zone. I had a spading plow for that reason one time. You know what that is? That's, I thought I could get 20 inches deep eventually with my aerobic zone. Like, make, you can't, you got to put residues in. You can't till it that deep bare. But you got to put residues in. And that's how if you deepen your aerobic zone, that's why this thing takes time. You'll get more water soaking in. You get better root development. And you got to do that with residues. See, and the other thing we do is I was telling you out here, see, that was following that. That we had to till again because, you know, that wasn't planned. That just happened to be the way it was. But see, now, like last year, we do yellow peas, and it was a total disaster. So we cut it and took it off for bedding. And we don't want to till it again. So then we go in there and no-till. What things don't work well on no-till? Southern sedan grass. What things work well? Well, the radish, the clovers. There's some things work really well on no-till them in. So we just take our big drill right out there, and we no-till in. After we get done, you'll see we'll, under our small grains, we'll, clovers and things we put in it. Unless, under that sorghum and agrass, I had clover. It didn't look real good. We go back in in the fall of that big old drill, and we add more in without having to till it. And that usually, we can thicken it up, because we refuse, like you said, to have a thin, poor stand. Back to my point about tillage, the fence post rots off here. That's the zone you can play with. And deeper buried stuff, that's why I don't want to plow. Now, I tell people, you are going to plow, because some guys plow, and I'm not the judge. you got your saws, you got your farms. But you see, the mi most miserable invention of the last century was a high-clearance plow. When I was a kid, you had to shred the stalks, you had to disc it, otherwise your plow plugged up. And now you had all the residues worked in, you weren't burying whole long residues. So high clearance plow allowed you to do things you shouldn't be doing. In my opinion, you're burying stuff that causes a zone, an aerobic zone. It's a water barrier, and it doesn't decay down in it. It turns putrid, and it gives off formic acids and all those little crazy things that are detrimental to root growth. 
The other thing out here, and I'm struggling with this one a little bit on those soybeans, see, because I tell people, what's your number one yield limiting factor on crop production? Carbon dioxide. You say, oh, we got too much carbon dioxide boiling off the soil. We're killing at the wrong time, and we're putting on nitrogen at the wrong time for conventional farmers. If we looked at when I shallow incorporate that, and that breaks down, and I have, if I do my tillage in the fall and I put my nitrogen off as a conventional guy, or all my manure is on, and there's nothing growing, all that carbon dioxide just boiling up and gone, I lost my opportunity for a good crop. What's the guy that grew the 400, first 400 bushel corn? What was his comment? To grow 400 bushel corn, you need to follow 400 bushel corn because I need the carbon. And he split his nitrogen up five times with high boys and stuff to release carbon dioxide. That's why you go in a field in the summertime in a cornfield and measure carbon dioxide. That's why when we cultivate, the fields turn green. We just release carbon. It wasn't the nitrogen that we stuck in the soil. We are organic farmers. We put air in the soil to release carbon. And that's fine with stomata on the bottom of the leaf and not on the top of the leaf. That plant was not designed upside down. It gathers the carbon dioxide and the gas is coming out of that soil. So I want that residue mixed in so I can release my carbon dioxide. So if I get all that residue laying on top, and that's why later tillage or something, I want to release carbon dioxide during the growing season into the growing crop. Anybody grow giant pumpkins? What do you put on? Biologicals, 10 times the mycorrhizae one should put on a field, and you use dry ice, carbon dioxide. Uh, this is what we'd be following in that field, and I'll just show that in my corn field in there. And this is what we have to be harvested the corn. Now, this is uh, interesting because I've tried understanding. I was talking about with Joel about that. See, you machinery guys in here, I, what I want, I want you to tell me at what point in time I don't need those corn leaves. I want, a, I want a slasher to come through my field and just whack the leaves off that corn and open it up so the sun can get in August 10th, August 15th. When are the leaves not necessary anymore? And open that baby up so the sun can get in and my cover crop can grow. Otherwise, it's shaded. If you put it, if you see all the, I went to that seed meeting, if you're going to grow organic corn, what do you want? Something bigger, fast-growing, vigorous, huge root systems, and tall and gigantic. Well, I'm shading everything else that grows under it. So seed corn doesn't do that, but even here, you see the seed corn, we took the males down 80 miles on a four-wheeler with a seed spreader. <laughs> with goggles on and raincoats. It's not fun going to a cornfield trying to spread cover crop seed. You know, we tried it all. And then we got a little boomer tractor. It's a 25-horsepower garden kind of a tractor with a rotavator on it. That was rotavated. 80 miles of rotavating. <laughs> I know it's a little extreme, but... It didn't, I thought spinning it on, we'd get it to grow in the corn. It didn't, because it's July in this part of the country or August. You see, it's too late for a cover crop to really grow. But we didn't get that end up there to grow. And just like I said, so rye is the number one thing. It's the cheapest kind of thing. It's the thing we're going to use all the time. We can plant it anytime we want. And now we just got to manage it and take it down. And you'll like see right there, that's just a little bit too late for growing corn. It should have been about five days sooner. I tell people, when you think the rye is ready to go, make sure the tractor is idling because you, 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 you run to the barn and you get out there as fast as you can. And it just got, it rains for three days. And I showed early, we always take things down on the early side because we're worried about letting it get away from us more than we are taking it down too early. And this one here is the one that, that's one year hay. This is, it was seeded a year ago with winter wheat as a nurse crop. We made four cuttings of hay. And then we came, that's when the neighbor stopped that day and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, my son didn't think the stand was good enough. I was just kidding him. And he said, oh, my gosh. And he said, I don't have any fields that look that nice. And I said, no, we're going to grow corn in here. That's, and see, it could have waited 10 days, couldn't have it? We'd have gained quite a bit more in if we had waited 10 days. But we aren't willing to take that risk, and down it goes, and in the ground it goes, and that became corn. And that was what I was talking about earlier. See, when we manage it, these cover crops that way, and what that is. Now, that's alfalfa, and we buy, the, we buy really top-quality genetics, the stuff that we've been breeding on for a long period of time. I've been breeding alfalfa for 25 years. It's the only alfalfa we know of that was bred on this fertilizer program. And it does really well, and it was Cal West and West, West Salem, Wisconsin. But see, so it's not cheap alfalfa we plant. Oh, no, I want top-quality and multi-leaf and all that kind of stuff. And we took it down. That's where we measured that foot of soil to measure how much nutrients it had. But you'll come back in a week and all those roots, that whole mass, and it was a little bit wet when we took it down. That's all digested, and you won't know what was in there. This piece of equipment, we really want. Now, I don't know. In that front hopper, we can put triticale and peas. We can put winter wheat as our nurse crop. In the back one, there's two tanks. One's got grass. One's got alfalfa, clover, whatever we want to put in there. And the seeds drop between the two rollers. That's how we get those stands. I do not want to no-till my legumes in a row. I want it to look like your lawn. And we'll generally, 
put on about 10 pounds of a mixture of alfalfa and clover is what we underseed in our oats. And then we put on about uh, uh, two bushel, three bushel oats, somewhere in that category. Here we're doing 30 pounds of winter wheat. That's how we establish our, our annual alfalfa. One year hay kind of program with winter wheat as a nurse crop. So then who eats this? What are you going to do with that? Here is where you spread your manure. Now, to me, manure is, a poultry manure is corn and soybeans run through a chicken. There's no complex carbons in it. Our dairy manure, they've been fed hay. And now we're on an all-forage diet, they've been fed a lot of hay. The manure digestibility, again, is quite different. Now I've got a slow, digestible, complex, dead carbon. And so now I, I can put livestock manure on here. I can put uh, laying hen manure on here. I can put a liquid dairy manure on here. But I also, I hope what's coming up next, you see, so I want to get that digested as fast as possible. Now we've got a, we've got a different head on our combine, and we actually uh, shred the, the stalks with the head. And uh, uh, this was at our field days a number of years ago. People were really shocked. That's a rotavator going through tall, tall standing corn. And you can say, you see, that corn is not the same. It, it, because it's got all those things that could have still living, live, and full of juice. Even though it's corn and it's low in protein and energy, but it's still highly digestible. Corn salad is fed to cows. It's highly digestible. Dead corn is already dried and dehydrated and dead. I almost need to re-inoculate it and put a, a subtle digester on it and get some manure on it or get some, some way to balance my carbon and nitrogen and get it digested. I don't need to do it if you take it down green. And, of course, we got our nitrogens in there. This is a true story. <laughs> you guys think corn is king in Illinois, don't you? Corn is the best cover crop that you could possibly grow. This is Cal West. Alfa, they're an alfalfa breeding station, and David Johnson, the plant breeder, is now owned by Dowell AgriSciences, and we got kicked off the farm. But that's okay. Uh, when Dow, when California Western alfalfa breeders had the farm, we were breeding alfalfa with them, and he came to my field days, and he said, you know, we want alfalfa out here. And he said, so this is not organic by any means. And so he said, what's a wonderful cover crop to grow? Corn. Look at all that biomass. And they're going through that little bitty rotavator taking that corn down. That was their cover crop on their corn. And then just like this one here, sorghum sedan grass. Why would you grow sorghum sedan grass? It's a smother crop. You got thistles, you got weeds, you let that stuff grow, it chokes everything out down below it, and it's a smother crop. Now they up there, he said, three times they mowed that thing down. This is a 25 acre, it's right by West Salem, Wisconsin, right along the interstate. It's south of the breeding alfalfa. And so, uh, anyway, they're taking that stuff down in there and to, the, and to work that back into the ground. That alfalfa breeding station, when Dow, before Dow AgriScience is bought, we doubled the yields, no herbicides, no insecticides, no fungicides on that farm. It was not organic. It was an alfalfa breeding station. When Dow bought it, hope you don't record this. Oh, it is. It's a true story. I don't care. They sent a list out of the spraying schedule for the alfalfa. And David said, I haven't sprayed in five years. Tell me why. And that was his career was over. So this is cattle feed chat. This is maximum length. We wouldn't mind feeding that in our all grass-based dairy. That's the maximum length I'd pay down for corn if I was going to do that. And I talked about this this morning. We really like this practice. See, we are not, have not done well with cocktail mixes. I've been asking people out here. We've tried a few things, and the seed's expensive, and where would I put them in? We do do some. I showed you I do the tiller radish, and we'll mix some mixes in there. We did some sun hemp a few years ago, and we mixed some of those things in. But where do they fit in my rotation? I have, the only place they fit is after a small grain. And you see this here, we've already got alfalfa and clover in there. We've got some weeds. Now we've got the straw stubble. I'm not going to till that all up and plant a cocktail mix. So we're just going to see. We say we put manure on there. How much, what do we need all that variety for? Well, some roots are very acidic. Buckwheat has got the most acidic root of any plant you can grow. And that, that acidic root then will suck out more nutrients out of the soil. And the, see, that's why the diversity of plants, I always thought that the, uh, see, the, Plants determine the soil life. It isn't the soil life determining the plants. And so they give off exudation things, and they, can turn, they determine the biology. And that's why multi-species, multi-plants gives you multi-biology. We can achieve that, I guess, without some of this. Not that that deep-rooted plant and some of those things won't be do, do us benefits. I don't really know. Uh, but does it fit us? That's the question. I did it again. And I showed you that there earlier. This will be seed corn next year. If you go on Highway 133 between Avoca and Lone Rock, right by the river, that will be seed corn next year. It will be its first year organic. I want to tell you one thing. That baby is set up to produce. Now, that will go down in the spring when that clover and alfalfa gets about six, eight inches tall, and then we'll do seed corn in there. And i got a feeling we'll do fairly well if the weather holds with us. And this is what it will look like in the spring. And you can see wheel tracks through there. It's called manure spreading. 
This is, I had uh, some people out to the farm, and we started a farm the first year. It was corn beans, corn beans, and terrible farming methods, terrible. And the guy that rented the land to the neighbors, neighbors of ours, I didn't want to take it away. The guy is my age. He's got terrible health problems, never gets anything done, and I didn't want to steal this land from him. Gosh, you, you, you want this land or you want the neighbor? Which one do you want? At some point, you've got to decide which one you want. Well, I don't want to. He's been a friend, and I'm not going to steal land from him. But finally, this guy said, I'm not going to rent it to him anymore. Well, we ended up with it. I went out, had a, an intern here from the Czech Republic this spring. We went out and dug samples. I should have taken pictures. We took soil samples all of the old pHs of the mid fives to under six. Phosphorus, single digit, potassium less than 100. Come on. Wow. We started putting on nutrients. And so we started doing things. Last fall, I had some people come in. We dug up that dirt. And you cannot believe from spring to fall what happened to that field. And there's earthworms everywhere. We couldn't find a single one this spring. Now, my thing is, where were they? With these little cocoons, just like weed seeds. Where were they? We teal we got accused of clearing wetlands. We took some pasture and got rid of the box elders, and I tilled it up and planted. I was going to reseed the pasture. Solid hemp. And I didn't have a license to grow it. There's no hemp been there since World War II. Those seeds were waiting for 50 years for the day I would till it. Those earthworms must have been waiting for the day we started feeding them and getting it going, because they sure came on like gangbusters. This is another area where we see we, we had up there, this is some land that will be organic next year. We transitioned 300 acres this year. That's why it took us a big, that's a big financial hit. We're not going to grow conventional crops and lose money. My neighbors, I'm not going to flood their market. It's already flooded. But see, this, some of this stuff didn't go as well, and the oats got big, and it was raining all the time. We didn't even combine the oats. We went in there and mowed it later. And this is pretty an interesting picture. This is back on, this is 30 acres on top of the hill, and it's way isolated. We're so isolated, that's why seed corn works so well for us. We only have two fields out of our 1,500 that join a conventional neighbor. Only two out of 1,500 acres. Isn't that amazing? Nobody wants to farm here but us. You see that oats in there? I went in there, and the oats is coming up green. We just flail mowed it. I went down and picked it up, and it came straw and all. We shredded the straw, and the oats, the seeds, fell, heads fell on top, and it, it rained so much it grew right out of the straw. It wasn't even attached to the soil. So anyway, that'll be, uh, it, so you don't see the clover in there, but there was such a mat of grasses and things in there. You know who that is? Steve Groff, tiller radish. This is Hungary. I don't know what crop we're standing. Does anybody know what that is? Some kind of a cover crop. One that I wasn't familiar with, I can guarantee you that. And of course, he always, got his, he always wears the same hat so you can recognize him. I have the same mustache so you recognize me. There's your daikon tiller, deep-rooted rash. Aren't you excited? It'll no root deep pushes deeper than 300 pounds of pressure into the soil. I'm sorry. What happens to radish? How many guys grew radish and is more above ground than below ground? That ground is hard and tight. What do they do? They go up. They don't go down. And so I said to Steve, I said, wow. I said, this didn't really work very well. I said, this is not a very big radish root here. And he said, yeah, but look at that. It did go, but it just got skinnier. Why they work so well, if it's a wet, muddy fall, they grow in mud, and they grow late until the snow flies. So if they grow in this muddy, the ground isn't hard and tight, they can grow through it. I said, I don't know how else they work, and they don't grow in hard, tight, dry soil, any better than any other crop, from what I've observed out here. Not that said, I was just saying that wasn't really doing the job of, of being called a tiller radish. It was only tilling the top two inches. <laughs> yeah, but it did have a little deep root going down in there. And that was my son taking that stuff down and our soybeans in there. This is out in Colorado, and I want to tell you another thing. If he, instead of going after a perfect soil test, let's find a perfect way to deliver minerals. This is another true story. This is in Snowville, Utah, or Idaho, right on the Utah-Idaho border. And it's called Snowville because the ground is so white with salt. And Horizon had a big farm there years ago, and they walked away from it because they couldn't farm it organically. And this guy's a dairy farmer, one of our consultants, and that's triticale. And he cut the first crop triticale off, winter triticale, to feed his cows. And he's ne this has never been done in Idaho. And now we got a cocktail mix in there. And he went in and he said, I'm the first guy ever to fertilize and water a cover crop. And I said, no, no, it's not a cover crop. It's your fertilizer and your nutrients. So you can see that. Look at that cocktail. So now we've got that. Trudy Kelly's not too complex carbons because he took off a cutting of hay in there. But now we got brown carbon mixed with green carbon. we got some highly adjustable and some soil release. So this might be the best of both worlds. And you see right in there. So then they took the... So now, you got to realize the pHs are 8.5, and, and you got to realize it's 14% sodium. You want some new land? Head to Idaho. Never grew over a 300 sack potato crop ever. And that year, he had a 600 sack potato crop. And everybody said, oh my gosh. And I said, because we bypassed the soil. The nutrients are now in that plant. 
We put manure on it. This is a dairy farm. We sucked all that stuff up in the compost. We put phosphorus and, and gypsum. We didn't put any minerals on the soil and expect them to get broken down in that heavy old salty dead soil. So the nutrients are being fed by another system besides the soil. Does that make sense? One more here. This is uh, out in uh, Dakotas. If you look at your uh, organic papers out, you can see this farm's for sale. It's 1,000 acres, 960-some acres. The Hedderite Colony owns it in, Pratt, in uh, Platt, South Dakota, the Platt River Colony. And you see they planted it. This is sandy lake soil, all irrigated. It's not a bad, you know, I guess it's quite a bit. It's all certified organic now. And they took this spring, and they live 140 miles from here. So that means they're not out here every day watching it. That's why they want to sell it. And I know this picture doesn't show up, and I can't help that out here, but uh, that was rye bulk spread in the spring seed that you're looking at back here. That's what that is. And then it did, I was there in July, and the soybeans are coming there. And on his, his right-hand side, it's about that long. On his left-hand side, it's about twice as long. That's where they didn't put the rye. It was 30 bushel beans, and they weren't on hand. They, they're fairly clean. I'm sorry I didn't get a better picture, but the only one I had that showed the two types of rye and the root systems on the rye. So even planted together in the spring, I was quite, it had some kind of a setback on that soybean from growing for whatever reason. I was surprised at that. So then let's see, you guys got out here, and I'm a fairly believe you. I said if the organic rules I was involved when they were written, if they would be written today, there's no way in the world you guys would have any or conventional manure would not be allowed. Back in the 90s, conventional manure isn't what it is today. There's no GMOs. There weren't all the drugs. There weren't all the chemicals. There weren't all the junk that we fed the animals. It's in that manure today. In Europe, they can't use conventional manure on an organic farm. Are you serious? Now, they can use antibiotics in their dairy cow, but they can't use conventional manure. They can't use organic manure. What would it look like if all the manure and all the chicken manure was all taken away from your organic guys? How many would be sitting in this room? I'd be talking to two of you. Manure is what you thrive on, and I'm not saying it's good, bad, or indifferent, but to say that organic is not, it's about clean air, clean water, clean food, and it's really, it's, you know, we've got to assume biology is going to clean this thing up. So anyway, we've got our dairy farm, we've got manure, so how do you handle it? So you see what we're doing? We're spreading it on a green-growing crop. We assume that's going to get sucked up into that crop. Now, this is dairy manure, and that's coming, coming out of a box spread. It's more of a pen manure kind of thing, and then that'll turn into corn. But anyway, so how do we handle manure? I wanted to show you really this. You see, someone brought that up today. How do I deal with this manure and where do I put it? I'd love to put it on those corn stalks I showed you. I'd love to be able to do that. Now, the guys in Michigan taught me a long time ago, if you've got a lot of manure and you think you want to spread it on, it's not a bad idea to put a light coat of lime, high calcium lime, on your soil before you buffer out that manure and you won't have as much of a negative effect on the soil, in my opinion. So that's lime spread down here. But this is the one that's what I wanted to really get to. On the left-hand side is rye planted on corn stalks in the fall. Right in front of you is oats planted in the spring. It passed up that rye. It outgrew that rye. And guess what? We covered that field with manure. Oats, I was telling some people earlier, oats is the crop that killed more cows than any crop ever fed. Oats is the best nutrient suck I've ever seen. If you want to kill cows, you're an organic farmer, you go out and spread 10,000 gallons of liquid dairy manure and plant oats and feed it to your dry cows and watch them die. It sucks up potash like it's coming through a straw. It sucks up nitrates. So the nutrients from the manure are now in that oats. They can't leach, they can't erode, they can't get away, and they're time-released. But look at the oats outgrew the rye, and the rye was planted in the fall, and the oats was planted in the spring. So now we'll get our nice oats and got that all sucked up. That's not a bad idea. If I was down further south, the guy that's up there by Lake Superior is probably not going to help. But the guy, if I'm in central, down in Illinois, I had several guys say, oh, I didn't get my rye plant last fall. What do I do? Right there. It's not a bad idea to spread manure and do that. When? When the ground's thawed, just starting to freeze. The ground is still frozen. It's muddy on top. Go plant your oats. And you don't cause any compaction. And when it gets going good enough, we drill right through the mud. And away it goes. It's amazing. I just want this as I talked about Glenn and Rocky. Right? I want to one more thing about nutrient holding and nutrient capturing. That this is just the mustard plant. And I've got to give some credit for it. I'm not going to plant mustard. I was born and raised on a mustard farm. And my father and sister, we had a hand pull it. A penny of mustard plant will never get you rich. <laughs> this is the old days. And so if you think I'm going to plant mustard on my farm again, you are wrong. I pulled enough in this lifetime. We are not planting mustard. It is a biofuming, and I understand that. So I just took the yellow flowers. See, if it's a yellow flower, I was taught, it's supposed to be high in calcium, like dandelions. If it's a the color of the flower determines the soil. For That's why these multicolors, some of these, they have inhibited trace minerals uptake, and it changes the color of the flower. 
the color of the flower is something to do with fertility. I don't know if this is true or not. These are stories I hear. So I took the yellow ones, and that's a biofumigant. And this so this is that sandy soil out there. But look at this. See down in this first town, we get down to nitrogen to sulfur ratios. Three to one. Most if you're not using sulfur, you're probably at a 12, 15 to 1 nitrogen to sulfur ratio. And because you don't have enough sulfur, you cannot make complete proteins. And most biting and chewing insects eat plants with incomplete proteins. I did my graduate work on sulfur. I did my graduate work on methionine, and feeding dairy cows. So he does not have high doses of sulfur. But that mustard sucked. It. That's why, just like killer radish, they stink when they rot down, like rotten eggs, because they sucked up all that extra sulfur. That's why it's a biofumigant. Now if we go to the other column... Calcium, 1.54. Now, that's pretty darn impressive for an old sandy soil mustard plant. And look at the phosphorus, 0.56. If you're a dairy farmer and got half that much, you're excited. Our state average on phosphorus in our forages are 0.28. So now, I've got all those nutrients. Now, that's a pretty complex plant that might not digest very fast, but he starts a year ahead of time. I just want to say all those nutrients are tied up in there that he's got available. I can look at that and say, boy, copper is really low. How much copper is in your farming system? The manganese is really high. Uh, you got some other things out here. Morons, okay, and zinc is marginal. So I can look at that and say, what's your trace minerals look like? He needs some copper, if nothing else. But anyway, so that's why when you test that and then we look at digestibility, it's not that. It's pretty fairly digestible, considering what that is. So that, that's exactly where you want your minerals. That's where you want your fertilizers, tied up in a carbon biological cycle. Then we get to know, have you heard about this gun smoke farm out there in South Dakota or not? Uh, Pure South Dakota is the largest organic transition that ever took place, I guess, in this country. It's 34,000 acres. And James Arness from Gunsmoke, I know you young people have no idea what I'm talking about. Kitty, Doc, Festus, come on. <laughs> you old farts know what I'm talking about. You young guys have rolled your eyes and said, where's he from? Another planet? No, James Arness, that's his farm, Gunsmoke. Anyway, it was a cattle ranch. And so it's in transition, and it's a big project out here, and it's this pier, and it's not the best soils. And, uh, it's uh, thistles, kosher weed, and, uh, and, and cheat grass. And it's in second year transition next year, and so I'm a little concerned. The weed bank is larger than anybody can manage. The neighboring organic farmer gave, offered a $25,000 reward if you can figure out how to deal with his thistles. I said, these guys better triple that reward because I don't know what they're going to do with them either. But anyway, that'll be in the cracks out here in the Dakotas. That just because it's big and just because it's all in one big hunk doesn't mean it's going to be success. 50 miles worth of road just to go look at it all. That's a square mile. So they could have mowed the weeds down so they got themselves a bat weed more. Then they got two of them. Then we realized it took 10 of them. <laughs> if you're used to milking 50 cows and you go to a 500 cow dairy farm, you might survive. You go to a 5,000 cow dairy farm, you probably won't make it. If you farm 100 acres now and you go to 1,000, you can pull it off. Go to 35,000 to see what you can do. It's a new ball game. I don't know if we got the mentality of the people that can do it. I wanted to hire conventional farmers that are used to farming 30,000 acres and teach them how to farm organically. I'm not going to take a small organic farm and put them on that farm and expect them to figure out how to do this thing. But anyway. Another project for you guys, and I had this discussion today from down in southwestern Iowa, is... Uh, uh, this here is a farm. This is a true story. I was on three farms last summer, and I'm a little annoyed by it, but I'll get over it. I'm on three farms last year that actually uh, take their poorest, crummiest land and put it in organic because they can at least make some money, and they totally ignore it. And I said, yeah, but the consumer, I'm doing my little soapbox dance right here, the consumer is paying you for a better farming system. They want nutritious, high-quality food, and they want you to farm in a good, sustainable, no biological, regenerative method. So they just took this land. This guy went out and planted the cover crop. No tilled corn in it. They farmed 8,000 acres and walked away. Took his alfalfa and ran a seven-year-old alfalfa set and ran his strip till machine and no tilled corn into it and walked away. 80 bushel corn at $10 a bushel is more money than he makes conventionally. I said, I don't think that's what the consumer is trying to reward. But there it is. Now, if your corn only looks like that, your cover crop really grows. <laughs> you see? <laughs> yeah, look at what that is. Oops, I did it again. I'm good at that. This is that Penn State, this is that no-till. We've never been successful with that. Now, I say that the conventional guy is the one that needs to intercede the corn. So organic guys, it's a little harder. Our conventional guys plant their corn in April, end of April, first week in May. They get done with their spring. They can plant their cover crop by the 10th of May. Richard Harwood, Michigan State, 25 years ago, oilseed radish. Eight out of ten years planting oilseed radish with a drill, skip the corn rows, when the corn was this tall, he drilled in the oilseed radish. Eight out of ten years had an increase in the corn yield. 
by having oilseed radish growing in the same field as corn. Him and I argued for a long time, and he retired on me. But anyway, us, we don't plant our, our corn until the third week in May, and then we cultivate, we finish cultivating about the middle of June, third week in June. It's too late to plant our cover crop. It's already starting to dry out and get too hot, and our corn is already knee high. So we just said, we have on our, we're, we're lazy German farmers now, we work our tails off, but we have a cedar on the back of our old buffalo cultivator. We spin clover seed right over top the crop. When it rains a lot, it comes right out of the world. It grows right out of your corn plant, by the way, for a little while until it gets dry. But we've had pretty good success with it sometimes, and how much is success? If it grew this tall, it never showed up again. I showed those pictures of my tall corn interceded with the irrigation, and it was just one here, one there, a little spindly. At one point in time, it was about that tall and green, and then it all died. Was that still a negative? Did I get my money back for doing my seed? I don't know. We're struggling with that thing, but I have not been able to figure out how to make that work. And that was the cedar. And you know, there's some growing in there. Are you impressed? Mm, now what do I do? Shred it down, work it back up, I have to go plant again. What do I do with it now? See, and that's why we got to figure out what fits what we're willing to do, what we're willing to spend. And again, we're going to go rye, oats, and clover are the three things we're not going to walk away from. Cheap, simple, easy. <laughs>